Hey everyone, this is Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to Untold Stories. This is a show where we dive deep into the lives and personal histories of some of crypto's most influential leaders and find out how the crypto movement truly came to be. Let's dive in. This podcast is presented by Blockworks Group, the only blockchain event and media production company I trust. For exclusive content and events that provide insight into the crypto and blockchain space, visit them at blockworksgroup.io. I promise you won't be disappointed. You know, a lot of the guests that we interview over the course of the show, there's a common denominator that stands out. And that common denominator is almost everyone that we've talked to has done something where everyone else has told them it's a stupid idea, myself included. In fact, when I launched BitInstant in 2011, I needed money from my parents because I didn't have much money to launch the company. And my dad told me it was actually a pretty stupid idea to get into Bitcoin. So it's very difficult to do something and follow through when constantly people that you're super friendly with and people that love you are constantly telling you it's a bad idea. And where you're not only having to sell the idea of your company and go to pitch venture capitalists and investors and people to give you money to launch a company, but as it relates to the cryptocurrency space, you have to pitch the whole industry. So you have to sell not just your company, but you have to sell the whole industry. My guest today, Ariana Simpson, she is one of those VCs. And she never turned me down in terms of the company. So I have no ill intentions. Ariana, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Charlie. In in when I was first launching uh, BitInstant, I couldn't raise money from anyone. It was the most difficult thing in the world to do. Um, I went to so many VCs, um, and I and everyone turned me down because they didn't understand why people were buying Bitcoin. They didn't understand why it didn't make it didn't matter to them that I had thousands of customers. I was doing volume every single day. I was running the company out of my basement. I was making a profit. I was making 5% on all transactions after all costs a day. We were making money, but we couldn't expand. But because the investors didn't understand why people were interested in Bitcoin, they weren't even interested in investing in the company. How do you get around this? Well, uh, I was very much in your same boat when I first got into the space. So, uh, you know, I, I got most heavily involved in around 2013. And so uh, at that point in time, it was still a very kind of contrarian idea. I was still that was the early days right there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so I got a lot of uh, feedback from my parents, from my parents, successful business friends, um, from other people, uh, you know, just around that this was never going to work. Bitcoin was going to be regulated out of existence, all kinds of things. Um, and so in that sense, you know, now I'm, I'm on the investing side of things. At that point in time, I was just kind of buying Bitcoin uh, with my personal money. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm very familiar with that. And, uh, to be honest, I don't know. I think, uh, for me, I just had this very clear sense that this was something very important and definitely the most important thing I'd ha ever seen. Um, and so, you know, I was like, well, I'm not quite sure how this is going to play out, but I definitely want to be involved. And so, uh, that really gave me the conviction to kind of, uh, keep going and then eventually to leave Facebook and join BitGo, uh, because I, I really felt like I was missing this revolution and I woke up literally every day. I'm not exaggerating, feeling like I needed to go to San Francisco and I needed to, to do this thing. Um, and you know, everyone, everyone told me I was nuts, but to be honest, I'm, I've also got a bit of a personality where when people tell me not to do something, it makes me want to do it more. So <laughs> I would guess Hold it's on. actually true about a lot of early you, Bitcoin people. <laughs> you left Facebook, which is one of the, it's the big four and it's one of the top companies in the world. And you were probably moving up rapidly and you left Facebook to go to a, I, I read that you were the third employee at BitGo. Yeah. That's a huge risk. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think um, I actually would say I'd probably think about risk differently than a lot of people. Um, part of my issue with Facebook was that I could see where I would end up if I did well in like three years. And frankly, it was not where I wanted to be. Uh, you know, I'd probably be making, I don't know, three or 500K a year doing ad sales and it'd be fine. But 
um, it just, it, it was not particularly exciting to me. And so that was really what kind of helped propel the decision. Um, I also feel like, especially early on in your career, most people are overly cautious because at the end of the day, um, I think you want to put yourself in the, in the place where you'll have the fastest growth trajectory. And I knew that I would learn a ton at an early stage startup, um, frankly, much more so than, you know, a four or 5,000 person company, which was, uh, about how big Facebook was at that point. So, so what happened? Just Ben, Ben Davenport just walked over to you and said, Hey, come over We're I'm starting this, this Bitcoin company. Cause he left, he left Facebook too around that time. Yeah, it's actually a really funny story. Uh, and my friends joke, it's like the most Ariana story because I tend well, to- Well, we're called untold stories, so let's hear it. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I had uh, started blogging about crypto stuff because I was spending a lot of time doing research and I felt like, you know, people complain about access to information now, but at that point there was really not a lot of kind of digestible content around um, how Bitcoin worked or, or a lot of different things uh, related to, to crypto. And so um, I started blogging and one of the topics that I explored was multi-signature wallets. Um, and so this was, uh, you know, shortly after Bitcoin had, uh, BitGo had, had gotten started. Uh, and Ben, as you correctly said, just had left Facebook, but I didn't know him at Facebook. Um, so I just wrote this blog post and I wrote about multi-signature wallets and BitGo was, if not the first, one of the first to commercialize, um, that offering. And so I wrote this post, mentioned the company, and then emailed it to the founder saying, you probably want to post this on your blog <laughs> because I'm totally shameless like that. And, um, so this is actually uh, will at BitGo. And so I asked, uh, so he was like, Oh, this is great. Like, uh, you know, we'd, we'd love to meet you. And so I ended up, uh, grabbing coffee with him. He was like, Oh, this is great. I want you to meet the other two founders. And I was like, okay, I don't really know where this is going, but sure. Um, and then we had lunch and, and then they basically were like, cool. So when can you start? And I was like, Oh, <laughs> I didn't know this was an interview. Um, and then with a little more back and forth, uh, you know, I, I then end up joining the team. Those so. are the best types of interviews yeah. when you don't know it's an interview. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So you took a risk in, like you said, you take, you follow, you, you calculate risk differently than other people, which I, I want to get into why, but before you essentially had to follow the leadership of Ben um, in BitGo. And I met Ben, um, actually, interestingly enough, around the same time when Ben, before Ben had started BitGo, he, I was in San Francisco, I think it was around, um, it was my first time in Silicon Valley ever. In fact, I didn't even know, I'll be honest with you, I, I grew up in Brooklyn, I didn't know what a VC was. I I thought VC standard for like Viet Cong or something, you know, I didn't know even <laughs> that what that was. And here I am in the Bay Area, um, meeting up with a friend of mine who worked for VMware, and he kind of was my guide to the whole Bay Area world, the Silicon Valley world. And I met Ben for the first time at the Facebook campus, and I was so starstruck, and I was like sitting out there, and, and thanks for the free lunch, by the way. And I was looking around the campus, and I was like starstruck. I was like, am I going to see Mark Zuckerberg? Am I going to see... Cheryl, am I, who am I going to see? Am I going to see any celebrities walking around here? Because I was, I don't know, 20, 21 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think the, uh, I've obviously met them when I was there. And uh, it's been interesting to watch kind of the evolution of the company. But um, I think it's, it's, for me, it's been exciting to watch you know, all of that and have such strong conviction in the path that I took, which, uh, you know, was, was definitely not what a lot of people expected at that point in time. And I got so many questions about it and people were like, are you kidding me? You just went through eight rounds of interviews, got this job, like 1800 people applied for the position that you ended up getting. Like, what are you doing leaving to join some like random ass three person company? <laughs> and, uh, you know, well, it wasn't three person. It was only two people. You were number three. Yeah. Right. Um, but, but for me, it was just like, I don't know, it was the obvious decision. And I was like, look, if I need to find another thing later, because this doesn't work out, like I will do that. But I really didn't want to be left kind of wondering what would have happened if I'd gone. And so to me, it was kind of the, the obvious choice. A lot of our listeners are probably going through the same exact pivotal moment of their life that you went through that day. Can we talk about it a little more? I want to understand who are the people that supported your decision and who are the people that told you it was a stupid idea? Maybe stupid is a too much of a harsh word. People who were trying to be brutally honest with you and saying, are you sure? 
Yeah. Well, I think everybody asks me, am I sure? But I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because I do think people who do that and are well-intentioned can actually kind of help stress test your thinking. And in in some cases actually uh, lead you to stronger conviction around the decision that you're making. Um, I would say my parents were definitely a big, big part of that. Um, You know, they've always been very supportive. They're academic, so they have really no involvement in, in any of the work that I do. Um, they were kind of like, uh, this seems a little bit strange. Are you sure about this Bitcoin situation? Um, do we know anything about this company? And I was like, yeah, yeah, the founders are super legit. They've done stuff before, whatever. Um, so that, that I think was, uh, a little bit helpful. Um, But, you know, in general, I think most people were pretty skeptical and, you know, I just kind of didn't really let that deter me. Um, And that was definitely what I call. You say that you calculate risk differently. Why why wouldn't that deter you? Well, um, like I said, I think most people, particularly early on in their careers, overweight uh, career risks. So, um, you know, they think, oh, well, if I, if I go to this startup and the startup fails, then, you know, it'll be a catastrophe. And I actually think that's not true at all. I think you learn a ton in those experiences and nobody likes failing. Like there's this definitely this kind of glorification of failure in Silicon Valley, uh, in particular. And I'm like, look, failing sucks. Like no high achieving person likes failing. Um, but when you look, when you step back and you have a little bit more, uh, time to evaluate how things actually went, often those experiences end up being very helpful because A, they're humbling, which some people certainly need, myself included, from time to time. Uh, but B, they're they're just like, you know, it's, it's one of the fastest ways to learn things. And so what I've discovered is that when you join a company or, or start a new job, basically months zero through six, you're learning a ton. Months six through, uh, sorry, nine through 12, you're like, um, okay, this is fine. Uh, I'm, my growth trajectory is slowing down and pretty much similar between six and six and nine. And then after that, you know, unless you're at a very fast growing company, um, you often tend to slow down. And I don't think people are are necessarily super conscious of this, but it does happen. And so, um, in many cases, when you're early in your career, this is like kind of counter to, to most advice where it's like, Oh, don't hop around too much. Uh, but if you do some of that, I think it can actually be very beneficial because, you just see more environments, you learn more industries, you see different roles and how different people manage and interact and stuff like that. And having that experience early on, I think is incredibly valuable. I read somewhere that a huge pivotal moment for you that really struck a chord about Bitcoin was the trip to Zimbabwe. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that was actually right before I started at Facebook. Um, so I'd been working at another startup in New York, which, um, you know, was fine, but again, was not kind of my life's mission. It was kind of in the fashion tech space. Um, what were you doing? I was uh, doing all the things because it was also a very small company, but, um, basically I was managing the, the relationships with, the boutique. So it was basically kind of like an Etsy, but instead of having individual artisans, it had, uh, fashion boutiques on it. So anyways, I managed relationships with those and did a bunch of other things. So it was kind of a sales role, kind of an account management role, um, and some ops thrown in there as well. So, um, I knew that when I left, I wanted to travel and I'd spent some time in Southern Africa when I was finishing up college, uh, randomly doing ecology research on a grant from the National Science Foundation. What do you mean uh, ecology research? Hold on. This is a whole other side to you. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have many lives. Um, well, so in, uh, I went to Penn State and I uh, graduated from the Honors College there and they would send out emails about kind of research and grant opportunities. And one day I got this email and I was, uh, it basically said, oh, there's this opportunity to get a grant from the National Science Foundation to go do ecology research in South Africa. Um, And the best part was the description literally said, this will present significant physical and mental hardship. And I was like, oh, that sounds great. I'm going to (laughs) apply. So I applied and lo and behold, I got the grant despite the fact that I had literally never taken an ecology class in my life. Um, And I don't know, I I guess, you know, I, I seemed like someone who could figure it out and uh, I will say my, my dad is a scientist, so I had some kind of uh, natural inclination in that direction anyways, but uh, it's not what I studied in school. So, I- Well, this is very interesting because ecology, <laughs> ecology is very similar to socioeconomics. And I feel like 
when you study ecology and you do research and it's very similar to studying how we, how not only um, organisms and animals act in their, in their environments, but, but with socioeconomics, it's also, there's a direct relation to how us as humans act in our environments. And that's kind of what Bitcoin is, right? Bitcoin is like the largest, as I say, the largest socioeconomic experiment the world has ever seen. And it's how us as humans act and react towards a money that's not controlled by a centralized party. Yeah, I think there's definitely some parallels there. Um, I think the the one of the elements of investing that I find most fascinating, particularly in liquid assets, is investor psychology. Um, and so I definitely think a lot about uh, a lot about those themes. Um, in this case, I was dealing more with kind of uh, trees and and grass grasslands. Basically, I was I was looking at the presence of certain nutrients and the effects that that had on grassland growth, and then how much carbon is stored in the subtropical coastal dune forest there. So <laughs> pretty far from, from what I'm up to now, but um, definitely some parallels. You're making me very thinking. sad right now. Why I, is that? I lost a tree yesterday. Oh no. Oh no. Yeah. What I happened? lost, I'm, most people laugh at me when I say that, but uh, my wife and I have 18 palm trees on our property and we love them. Uh, we love our palms. And one of them got this uh, mushroom fungus that I can't, I can, I could, tell you right now which which one it is and we we did everything we could to prevent the um the tree from from dying um it's called ganoderma mm. Sorry and to we hear lost that. we lost our tree and the landscaper has to come out and, and cut it down we'll be holding memorial services next week for him oh well i hope you can put in a replacement palm but sometimes you got to sacrifice the one so it doesn't affect yeah. the others yeah he said that if we don't cut it down, it could it could spread. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what kind of what kind of what did you what did you study? Um, I studied international politics and Spanish, and I minored in history. It's a perfect um, jump to ecology. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I you know I guess I've just always been very curious. So whenever something uh, captures my attention, I tend to go really really deep, um, and that's definitely what happened with. Uh, with Bitcoin in the early days. So I just kind of like holed up and started doing all kinds of research, went down some very deep internet rabbit holes, um, studying this stuff. And that was a particularly interesting thing to teach yourself because I felt like it was pulling together so many different fields that I had to go and like, learn like, Oh, what's SHA-256? And like all, you know, I, I had one of those classic instances of 10 million tabs open and trying to, trying to keep on sure. track, but also having to go down all these different side roads in order to figure out kind of what what overall things mean um so <laughs> a great app is tab tab suspender i use to suspend my tabs it's mm. wonderful okay i'll check it out because then you're going to be using so much cpu because your your browser is having to keep all these tabs open i use tab suspender it's fantastic it basically freezes the tabs and then when you go back to the tab it'll relaunch it it'll unfreeze it ah interesting okay yeah i'll definitely check that out so your, your browser thinks it just has one tab open hmm they are not our sponsors, but I wish they were. I'm going to call them tomorrow. <laughs> to say, hey, by the way, we're talking about your 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 uh, your app here on the show. So, yeah, so what is it? Then. What is it? 2012. Right? We're talking about Zimbabwe, South Africa. What year? Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're in 2012. 20, 2013. 2013. Yeah, 2013. 2013. You're you're with a big shear, and you're you're wading through the forest. <laughs> In in South Africa, and you're you're what are you crossing the border into Zimbabwe at this point? I'm trying to visualize this. Yeah, well, so this, these were actually two different trips. So the first trip I was doing research, and the second trip I went back because I just wanted to travel around. And I'd left the startup I was working at, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to go explore for about a week. So I get to Namibia. Actually, I had a friend who was in Namibia, and so I said, okay, I'll start from Best there. Best oysters. <laughs> Yes, yes, exactly. Um, so I get to Namibia and I'm like, cool, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to be here for a few days, then I'm going to go to Zimbabwe and see Victoria Falls, and then I'll fly back to the States. And I got there and I was like, holy smokes, this is actually amazing. And I just quit my job, so I don't really have to be back for anything. So I think I'll stick around. So I ended up spending a couple months there. Um, and it was amazing. I mean, I, you know, that region of the world is, is incredible, but um, it was a really interesting experience. Uh, you stay in, in Livingston? Um, yeah, I was, well, so I was kind of on both sides of the, uh, of the falls. Cause there's the yeah. 
uh, Zimbabwe side and the Zambia side. Um, so I was in Victoria Falls proper for, uh, actually a majority of the time. Uh, but I did go through Livingston. Um, so yeah, so I was there and I, I met, um, I met a bunch of local people and this woman homebell was like, okay, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take you around, show you the village. And she showed me kind of the, the poor part of town, which was, uh, as you can imagine, quite rough. Um, and she took me to see the hospital and all these kind of like parts of the school and all these things. Um, and we talked a lot about kind of the economy and stuff like that and, and what they'd experienced. And, um, you know, I was like, when I first arrived, I was like, Oh, interesting. They're using us dollars here. I wonder what that's about. Uh, because you know, I was kind of familiar with, with the fact that they'd had hyperinflation at a high level, but I didn't really know a lot of detail. Um, and so they actually had to switch over to the U S dollar to restabilize the economy back in the day. Um, and, uh, you know, just kind of hearing the stories of people there and, you know, it's one thing to think, Oh, okay, there's hyperinflation. That sounds shitty. But then, to, you know, speak with a woman who's like, oh, my, my child died because there wasn't penicillin in the hospitals and there was no grocery food and grocery, uh, groceries in the stores and things like that. Um, you know, it was very, very, uh, hits of, home. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so when I came back to the U S, uh, that was right around when I was interviewing at Facebook. Um, I was just thinking a lot about all of this stuff and I started doing, uh, you know, someone was like, Oh, you should look at Bitcoin. Do you, do you know about Bitcoin? And I didn't. And I was like, what's this? And then I read the white paper and I literally had like the classic epiphany moment that, you know, a number of other early folks in the space have described. Oh, interesting. I was just like, yeah, yeah. I was so like, you were shit. there when you had first heard about it. No, this was back when I was in, in the U S again. So okay. I, I was there and kind of had the, I guess you could say the mental priming for it. Um, and then I came back to the U.S. and I was discussing these things with a friend of mine who actually ended up starting Blockstack, uh, Ryan Shea. And he was like, oh, like Bitcoin seems relevant to your, you know, interests. You should check it out. Do you think if you had had that moment in Zimbabwe and seen it with your eyes, you would have taken Bitcoin as seriously? Because a lot of people ask in the U.S. and you've probably been asked this question a million times. Why do we need it? Why do we need a Bitcoin here in the U.S.? Why do we need blockchain technology? Yeah. I mean, I, I think seeing, um, you know, going to Zimbabwe and seeing their reality was definitely, uh, definitely part of the kind of mental priming that was necessary for it to really click for me. Um, I will say there are a number of other factors that just kind of made it make sense. So for example, I grew up in Italy. I was in Italy for the first 17 years of my life. Um, and you know, that part of the world has certainly had some, some currency woes over the years. Um, and also just the issue of kind of moving back and forth between Italy and the U.S. and having to continuously change money, losing <laughs> a huge amount of money um, on on every uh, transaction and things like that. Um, and actually, when I when I came back to the U.S. after Zimbabwe, I started um, supporting a, a family there, and I was sending money via Western Union. And it's I swear it sounds like I'm exaggerating, but I was literally spending 25 percent when all was said and done on fees to Western Union in order to send them money, which I thought was just outlandish. Did it um, anger you? Yeah, it did. Because I was like, are you fucking kidding me? This is an absurd amount of money for you to be taking. Um, it's and, almost cheaper over time to fly yourself there and bring the money with you. Yeah, basically. I mean, the especially because I was like, this is literally a dollars to dollars transfer. How does this make any sense? Um, but yeah, that was, you know, that was the reality. There wasn't, they kind of have a pseudo monopoly on that. How can we expect people to grow when they can't even move money freely around the world and trade with other people? If someone in Zimbabwe wants to start a business, even, you know, making bracelets or anything, um, they can't do it. It's impossible. Moving money. Yeah, it's very difficult. Um, but, you know, I, I, and I think I, I will say the other thing is um, – Bitcoin also made sense given some of the early infrastructure that I saw there. So, for example, um, you know, there everybody had phones. Like it was crazy. I went to this tiny, tiny village, um, kind of a, a few miles away from Victoria Falls. We took this like super sketchy, quote unquote, taxi, like five miles down the road, and then we hiked for like forty five minutes into the bush. And I mean, this was like a mud hut situation. They were like, we think you're the first white person who's ever been here. And I was like, holy smokes. Okay. Um, but the, the, one of the older women there had a phone, like a feature phone and she had obviously no power out there. So like once a week she would like go into this, the, the village and like charge the phone. 
um, back in, in, well, not the village, you know, I guess it's town, Victoria Falls. Um, but to me, that was just so crazy because I don't know, like, that's not what I would have expected. You know, this, this kind of like access to phones that worked pretty well, um, and, you know, had the ability to, you know, potentially send a Bitcoin transaction or whatever, um, was, was really surprising to me. Uh, nobody was doing it yet, but I, I definitely saw how that could be possible because none of these people had bank accounts. And so, you know, the, that no, their phone was, credit is their money. Exactly. Yep. I toured a village. I was in, I was in Zambia, um, last year and my wife and I toured a village and it was the village in every sense of the word, no electricity, um, mud huts, like you said, chickens running around, they have their central courtyard, which is where they all gather and meet. Um, there was one house that was half built, made out of brick, and it was actually the father, the the son of the the woman who gave us the tour. And the son comes back every few months because he's a police captain in the capital of Zambia, and he's a police captain comes back every few months. And has enough money to buy bricks in order to continue building the house that I eventually retire to when he's when he's finished. But it was you felt like you were in the Stone Age. I mean, and every no roads, nothing. But first of all, everyone had a smile on their face. We met a lot of people, super happy. Mm-hmm. But this was the oddest thing that, that happened. As my wife and I are taking pictures of of the little kids and we're 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 playing with the chickens and the lady who is giving us a tour around just whips out a cell phone and picks up a phone call. And it was such a contrast because at that moment you're taken out of the stone age and now you're in 2018. Yep. So all yeah. these people have cell phones and I was like, where do you, where do you charge your phone? That like, I don't see any, there's no power lines or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. Oftentimes they, they bring the phones back to somewhere else nowadays, you know, this wasn't as common, uh, in 2013, but nowadays people have solar chargers or things like that. So yeah, there's a few different ways, but it is fascinating. I saw them have little solar chargers and they even powered like little TVs and some of them even had satellite dishes (laughs) that they were powering. Very interesting. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. And, you know, to me, it was just clear that, uh, you know, Bitcoin wasn't being used yet, but it certainly could be. Um, and so it didn't seem like such a stretch, uh, for that to be kind of a real use case. I mean, when people are, are, are desperate and they're in a really, you know, tough spot, like they will figure it out, you know, to the extent that that's possible. And so, um, I think it's easy from the United States to be like, oh, well, you know, things work fine. It's like, well, it <laughs> depends who you are, you know, and where you are. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that eventually. It's a very selfish you know, question. It's a very selfish question when people ask me, well, the United States, we're doing great. Why do we need it? It's a very selfish question because you're not thinking about the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think the the narrative around crypto being used in other parts of the world has definitely been been discussed quite a bit. I would say that eventually I think it's going to be um, somewhat more like, you know, ubiquitous in the sense that there will be a lot of use cases which um, are very valid in the United States and other parts of the world as well, um, even beyond kind of crypto as money. Uh, But I think that's a very important kind of early use case. And adoption in you know, a lot of the world is actually rising very significantly um, because people are actually using it. So we've been talking for a while now, and I want to make an observation. We haven't said the word blockchain once up until this point. (laughs) We've been saying Bitcoin. And I have to say that's extremely refreshing because I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an investor in a lot of different projects, a lot of different companies that have their own tokens, coins. I mean, a lot of my friends had founded some of the coins like Monero, Ethereum. Um, but I never forget why I got into Bitcoin in the first place and why it's important. And I very, very against people who say that you can have blockchain without Bitcoin. However, I'm living in Florida and I'm kind of out of that Silicon Valley world ground zero where the companies are are being born the investors are and you're an investor yourself do you get that question a lot do you do you what's your take on that whole blockchain without bitcoin attitude so 
I think I'm, I'm, I'm still a little turned off by the term blockchain because I still have battle scars from the last bear market where everyone was like, oh, you know, blockchain, not Bitcoin. And, and that was just honestly, I think, a way for people who didn't really understand the value in it to sound like they were pro technology, but actually not be. Um, <laughs> and so I, what I mean by that is like, I think the brilliance in Bitcoin's design is the is in kind of the, how the incentives are constructed. And if you remove the element of, you know, money, kind of this, this idea of a Bitcoin as a coin, um, the incentive design falls apart. And so you can't really have a blockchain that works without that, because if you did, it would basically just be a database. And so while, you know, they're, probably are some use cases that are that are being figured out where you know it makes sense for a small group of uh, enterprise companies to be working together in kind of a private chain consortium and permission blockchains yeah yeah um, that <laughs> generally speaking that's not what the majority of the world needs and so to me I think oftentimes it's it's kind of just a way to sound like you're pro pro technology pro crypto but not actually be um, and also, I think not always, but often kind of betrays a misunderstanding of why Bitcoin's incentive design is so brilliant and why um, that sort of mechanism, whether it's in Bitcoin or in a number of other coins that I think are very legitimate, um, you know, why the token is needed. Have you ever been pitched a company that you totally said to yourself, why are they even getting involved in blockchain and just been so turned off by it, you got up and walked out? Um, I have not walked out because I try not to be rude unless it's absolutely necessary. <laughs> That's why I'm not a VC. <laughs> um, no, but but I've definitely I've definitely had cases where I was like, i I'm sorry, you have a token why? Or like what are you doing? Uh in general I think I, I screen pretty well, so I don't end up in too many of those meetings. I get a lot of those decks, let me tell you. Can you but, give us an example of a deck or a meeting you've been in without giving too much away if you don't want to badmouth someone? Um, I mean, uh, let's just- Long put, Island Ice Tea? Uh, yeah, that's one, Kodak coin. Um, let's, let's just put it Kodak. this way. <laughs> I think one of the benefits of a bear market is that um, the, the overall number of companies that I'm being pitched has gone down significantly since 2017, but the quality has gone up by an order of magnitude. So that's really refreshing because, you know, my job is, is to look through companies and, and see who I think has a lot of potential and the less kind of, um, nonsense you have to wade through in order to find the best entrepreneurs uh, the better. And so the people who are starting companies now have, have generally a much better plan because nobody starts a company in a bear market who doesn't actually have conviction, who doesn't actually want to spend the next, you know, five, 10, 15 years building this business. And 2017 obviously was very different because there were a lot of people who were like, oh, we think we can do an ICO and raise a bajillion dollars without actually having a business plan. And, you know, shockingly, a lot of them did. And so, uh, you know, I, I understand why the incentive was there for folks to do it, but that's certainly not the kinds of people that I uh, invest in. And so just having fewer of those pitches come across my desk is definitely helpful. So here you are and it's 2013 and you decide to join BitGo. Was there an office? Did you work out of someone's house? What was that like? The, what were the first six months? What were the first three months like? At what point when you joined the company, was it still starting up or did it have its feet off the ground? Did it have its vision, its direction? Tell, tell us, try to allow, I want our listeners to understand what it was like being in a, a an early Bitcoin startup in 2013 that actually is now is one of the the, the most well known companies in the space. What that was like? Yeah, so um, the company did have an office uh, in Palo Alto, um, just off the California Ave uh, stop on Page Mill Road, if I recall. Um, and you know, it was it was pretty bare bones. Um, it was a fine office, but there were desks and not much else, and there weren't you know there weren't a ton of people there either. So um, it was yeah, it was pretty early, very very startupy. Um, I got there, and it wasn't super clear what my role was. Um, the idea was Ariana seems 
competent and like hopefully she'll figure out ways to make herself useful. Um, That's how all startups are though, right? Yeah, no, totally. Um, and, and that was fine. Like, honestly, I, I prefer to be, uh, left to my own devices to, to figure things out. And in general, I think that was a very good environment for doing that. So I ended up doing, you know, lots of things. I was, I was writing blog posts for the, um, for the company's blog. I was working with some of our bigger clients who were, you know, some venture funds, hedge funds, companies that were quietly buying Bitcoin or that were involved in kind of the industry in some way, shape or form. Um, so kind of working across all of those and, and um, yeah, just kind of trying to figure out how to help build BitGo's brand and, um, you know, hopefully get the industry further along. The, I, I kind of joined in a weird time because it was right. Um, I was basically there for the entire last bear market, which was in some ways a horrible time to join the industry. And in other ways, Do you remember what one. the price was when you first started? Um, it, was, it was going down though. It wasn't hundred. on its way up. Yeah, no, it was oh, definitely wow. trending downwards. Yeah. So that was um, a long bear market. It was, it was, it was pretty painful. Um, because I think the key difference is that now I have very, very strong conviction that the space is not going away. So, you know, who the winners will be long-term is still somewhat to be seen. And, you know, there's a lot of unknowns, but, um, the industry is not going away. And that was definitely not clear at that point in time, even to people who are believers in the space. Like obviously are you listening to my other podcasts. Is that, no. is that where you got that line from? Cause I, I literally say the same thing. Really? Um, oh, in my talk. <laughs> great. Minds. I don't know. <laughs> it's what I say completely, almost, almost verbatim, but the major difference between the bear market that we're going through or just went through, depending on who you ask and, and all the previous ones, cause I got wrecked in the first bear. The, the first real one I got wrecked in was the price pump to $36 and I mm. bought it in at 32 and then went back down to two. The major oh. difference. Yeah. I got killed. The major difference between all those. And this one is no one's at, no one's saying, will this bear market ever end or no one was calling it a bear market they were just saying bitcoin is dead or will bitcoin come out of this but now everyone's saying all right how long is this bear market going to be when is the next bull market it, this industry is not going away there's no question on is this industry going away even the most naysayers of the space are not really saying that anymore i agree i think that's that's very much where we are and um it wasn't where we were at that point in time but I think one of the benefits that was definitely not obvious at the time, but in retrospect, um, was that I got to know a lot of people who have since gone on to become very important and, and some of the leaders of the industry. Um, and if I had tried to get to know everybody, you know, in 2017 or 2018, nobody would have given me the time of day. Um, but because we'd all been kind of early and, and were in the trenches together at a time when it was very much kind of like, us against the world kind of mentality because we were really just trying to like make it. Um, it was, it was very helpful. And I don't think that would have been possible if I hadn't been working in the space at that point in time. Do you think that that us against the world mentality has disappeared? Um, it's a hard I question to that. answer. I miss that. Yeah. I, look, I think I wish there were more of it. I think there's unfortunately a tendency to, um, but this is, you know, this has always been the case. There's definitely a tendency to kind of infight in the space. And I really want to shake people when I see them doing that, because I'm like, listen, the real risk here is, is just that the industry doesn't do well. If the industry does well, like everyone is going to, to succeed. Well, not everyone, but most. <laughs> and so, you know, I think the infighting is really unnecessary. Like let's grow the pie rather than kind of stabbing each other in the back. Um, but I think, you know, these, these topics become very hotly contested because in some ways, you know, people have a almost quasi religious attachment to the ideas, um, which frankly is also one of the reasons why I think Bitcoin and crypto has succeeded so far is because people care about it to an almost irrational degree, um, from an ideological perspective, not just a purely economic one. Um, and so I do think that to some extent, those conditions have led to crypto getting to where it is today, but at the same time, it's, it's also a little bit dangerous when that's taken to, um, you know, too far. Fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
But what I'm trying to understand is, are people getting involved today? And you meet a lot of these potential founders that um, are looking for investment or people looking for direction. When you look at them, do you say to yourself, these people are all in it for the money or do you still meet fresh, you know, freshmen, let's call them freshmen who really truly believe that and are excited about this space because of the same reasons that you got involved in the space? Oh, I definitely think there's still a lot of people who are in it for the right reasons. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's always going to be folks who aren't, but I think in general, the space is still, good <laughs> if if we can bring it down that to that simple level um if if i the moment i don't feel that the majority of people are in it for the right reasons is you know when i think i'll leave the space but i think now people are really excited about bringing access to uh financial services to people who didn't previously have it in some cases that's abroad but in many cases that's actually in the us as well um, the idea of, of kind of eliminating unnecessary middlemen and, and bringing down costs for consumers, like all of these ideals, I think, are, are very much alive and well in the space. And so um, those are some of the things that have me really excited. I have a lot of friends who got involved the same time that you did, you know, 2012, 2013, 2011, even uh, some friends who got involved in 2009, 2010. And when I speak to them now, just they're burnt out. Um, mm. and when I ask them why they'll, they'll tell me is because the, the industry change and a lot of them, I have to be honest with you. A lot of them have given me that line of, it used to be us versus the world. And now it's us versus us. More than one person has, has fed that line to me. And I get it because I'll be honest with you. I've, you know, laid awake at night thinking about, is there a future for me in this industry? Have I just you know, chiseled my, my, my legacy in the space. I've done what I've done. We've done what we've done and I should just move aside and let the new class, um, of freshmen come in and, and do whatever, whatever they need to do. Am I feeling a little bit burnt out? And I struggle with that. I'll be honest with you. I do. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, um, you know, it's, there's always kind of going to be this sense of, well, you know, the, the early days, it was like X, but, you know, change is constant and inevitable. And you see this across all kinds of things. I mean, the, the early people who went to Burning Man, some of them are like, oh, you know, it's jumped the shark. It's not what it was before. And people say this about cities too. They're like, oh, you know, I, I read a line in this book and it was published in like the seventies. And it was like, oh, you know, San Francisco's changing and you know, this, that, and the other thing. And and so <laughs> it, it was, it literally could have been written like last week. It's just all the same criticisms and stuff. And I'm like, uh, yeah, you know, some of them are valid for sure. But in general, um, expecting things to say the same is I think, not realistic and not even necessarily desirable because it's often easy to kind of look back and idealize how things were at the beginning. But let's be honest, like, do we really want to go back to like Bitcoin 2012, 2013, when like nobody gave us the time of day and like it was viewed as something that was purely for, you know, drug dealers and things like that? Like, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think that's where we want to be uh, definitively. And so at the end of the day, I think you have to kind of expect that that change is going to happen and that things are going to evolve. And frankly, if we want crypto to be successful, I think it does need to be more inclusive and appeal to more different demographics. And at the beginning, it was pretty fringe. Um, and you know, tell me how, I, I think how was it fringe? Did you feel that you were, uh, did you feel that when you got involved in the crypto space in early days, did you feel it was like you were kind of an outlier? Did you feel like there was a, a certain type of person or a group of people like the crypto anarchist or whatever that was more running the space? And how did you feel about that? Yeah. I mean, somebody one point called me a crypto anarchist and I was like, literally, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> um, but I, I think like part of it was, was really the negative association that crypto had, you know, just with like dark web and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, I, I wasn't, that was definitely not why I was excited about it, but I think, um, that, that was often what people outside of the space, 
thought of. And to me, it's actually been fascinating to watch Bitcoin transition from like, oh, this, you know, dark web internet money to now it's like the blue chip investment and like institutions are buying it. And if you think about the time span over which that transition has happened, it's actually incredibly short. So it's fascinating to see how quickly Bitcoin has gone from being like, very bad to being like the gold standard in crypto. Um, and it's kind of the first thing that people start to buy when they move into the space. So people don't think to it me, that's just been fast. amazing. No, definitely they, not. That's what happened. That's, that's the, it, it's moving so quickly. This whole space is moving so quickly. Well, what does that mean? Like, where will we be in five years from now? Um, well, I think I think we'll see a lot broader usage of crypto products. A lot of them, I think, will be in the trading and credit and lending, kind of the general financial infrastructure category. Um, I think we'll see a lot of usage in gaming as well, um, and probably a few others, like potentially payments and things like that. Um, but, you know, it's always kind of this weird thing where, like, less stuff happens in, in a one-year time span Um, than you might expect. But then if you look like out a few years, things actually have moved pretty quickly. Um, And that's true across a number of metrics, like actual usage and adoption and projects that are live, but also things like price. Um, And my guess is that we'll continue to see that trend. So in, uh, this is a question I wanted to ask you earlier. So in the bear market, and you you were just starting at BitGo and it was a bear market, what are you guys walking walking around the office, just like slumping your feet, all depressed, your heads down, looking at the Bitcoin price at three hundred dollars? No, we definitely tried not to do that because <laughs> that would have just been depressing. Um, no, I mean, I think I think in general we were just really focused on kind of laying the the foundations for the business and trying to figure out like what we needed to be doing at that point in time to set ourselves up for success when the market recovered. Um, and I think that's why you know, in general, bear markets are really important because you can't just like whip up a business overnight or, I mean, it's very rare that you can do that um, when the market starts to move in the right direction. So you kind of have to be building across different cycles so that you're well positioned. I mean, other companies in the space like Coinbase went through a similar thing where it's like, okay, for a while there, we're not even sure if if we're going to make it or if this business has any legs. And then things start to move and you're like, ah, yes, now I see why I spent the last two years of my life putting in what seemed like uh, you know, perhaps fruitless work, um, because the fruits do come, they just come later. Did you have an exit strategy? I mean, that's part of risk, right? Saying to yourself, if this doesn't work, I can always go back to Facebook or always do something else. You know, I've never really been one for an exit strategy. Um, in general, I find that if you are doing good work, um, and you know, you have some degree of visibility in your industry, opportunities will come. And I, I tend not to be someone who, is like I, I like to be focused on one thing. So okay, whatever you're, I'm doing, I'm in it. <laughs> but you're an inv- you're an investor, and you must ask you know potential companies what's your exit strategy. I actually don't ask that. Um, really, I think yeah, because I mean, look, the, the exit strategies there's there's three. There's they get acquired, they <laughs> IPO, or kind of something in that general category, um, or they fail. So like, I don't. You know, it's it's kind of I think a, a silly question because I can generally think about you know who the potential acquirers are or things like that. But really, I want to be backing people who want to take this thing, whatever it is that they're building, whether that's a, a network or a company, uh, to the moon. And I actually think that having an exit strategy early on, I tend to invest pretty early, uh, is a bad thing because. It means that you're already thinking, how do you get out of what you're doing? And I want somebody who's like excited to build this thing for the next 10 or 15 years. And, uh, you know, having having already signaled a, an exit strategy to me seems like very short term thinking and not the kind of folks that I generally want to back. That's a very interesting observation because um, I've been told different. I've been told that founders who don't think about the exit strategy are not someone that they'd want to invest in. And I've always... I feel like I've, I agree, I agree with you and, but I, I've never been able to put that into words or if I did, I would sound really dumb, but you're right. Uh, if someone's so thinking about what the exit strategy is, then they're not really interested in building it. But the problem is that I've noticed with founders 
or, you know, you have like the CEO, CTO, and then sometimes the COO. But generally speaking, when you have a founder of a company, they're generally the CEO or the CTO, um, sometimes the CFO or COO. But how do you prevent, how do you prevent burnout? How do you prevent founders from like getting that six to nine months in just a little bit burnout of, 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 of what they built? How do you prevent that? Well, I think burnout honestly is also a function of like how the business is doing because folks tend not to get that burnt out when they're succeeding. There are certainly exceptions, but generally speaking, what is really devastating is when you are working super hard and you're not getting anywhere. So you're just kind of spinning your wheels fruitlessly. Um, so in that case, you know, it depends on the circumstances, but I think often what people need is a small break, uh, because what you really need is a change of idea and a better strategy rather than working harder. And, um, in some cases, or I think oftentimes the best way to get an idea is to like leave your current environment and go off and like do something else for a while. Um, and in many cases that helps with kind of rest and recovery, but it also helps with new idea generation, which I think is critical if a company is in that position. Like what? Um, if I'm running, let's just say, because I ran into a different situation. I was running Bit Instant, and the company was doing extremely well. And I went from, and I'm asking because I'm trying to, I want to learn from the future. I want to, I see myself at some point running a successful company. And I know this, this may happen again, and I want to prevent it from happening again. But here I am, and it's a year in, and the company's doing really well. We raised a bunch of money. We're profitable. We're giving returns to our investors. We have 30 people working for the company. And my typical day-to-day job as CEO doesn't really exist anymore because I have people doing that stuff now, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of spinning my wheels a little bit. I will go to the office. I have my coffee. I do my business meetings, blah, blah, blah. And I'm bored. I'm bored. And because I'm bored, because the company's doing well, I'm not really there anymore. And then because I'm not there, I'm not seeing the cracks. And then over time these cracks end up imploding the company. Mm. How do I prevent that? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I, I think it depends. Uh, I guess what, what I would think is that, you know, if you were not necessarily as involved in kind of the day-to-day operational side of things, um, you know, you would have been either focused on hiring, um, uh, focused on fundraising, if that was necessary, focused on kind of figuring out where you wanted to take the company next. Did you want to develop kind of a, a extension of your business in some direction or things like that? Um, that was what the problem was, is I, I couldn't, I couldn't move the company to the next level because the industry wasn't at that next level yet. I was already caught up. We were at the forefront. We were leading the charge. So we didn't really have like what would be my next step is more of what's the industry's next step. And I couldn't really I had to wait a little bit. I mean, that's that's definitely a reality. I think um, oftentimes for new categories or new uh industries, there is a little bit of this, like you set the stage for the industry and then the industry kind of has to catch up. And I, I would suspect that, um, I should have taken a long vacation. (laughs) Sometimes, sometimes you do need that. Um, no, I, I do think there's some truth to that. And, um, in some cases, you know, that's the, the best path forward is not just the plow through everything in some cases. Um, and it sounds like you may have been in, in a little bit of a lull, but in general, I think just kind of keeping forward motion and making sure that the wheels don't fly off in any direction uh, while the industry catches up is probably the best thing you can be doing. I'm a very big fan of paid time off. I'm a very big fan of it, not because I like to get paid time off. I'm usually on the other side of the one giving it. But I'm a big fan of it because when you, when you, as long as you don't have people that abuse it, when you, when you tell your, your staff and your team, listen, when you feel like you need to take some time off, You go do it and don't tell me where you're going. You do you and you come back. Tell me when you're coming back. Of course, you know, don't disappear for three months, but, but do whatever you feel is best. And that's what a lot of companies have gone to doing paid time off without having a specific set of time over the course of a year. How do you feel about that? I think that sounds healthy. Um, You know, I think obviously the biggest thing is making sure that uh, no balls are dropped when people need to take time off. But I think in general, Um, if you have, uh, 
people who are excited to come to work and who are not just drained, um, you'll have a better outcome. And so I think it's a fine line between, you know, obviously making sure that you're working hard and yeah, startups are difficult and they do require a lot more work than what you startups would be doing. Suck. <laughs> That's exhausting. I mean, oh, they it's are- like we're addicted. It's like a drug. You, you do it, you get through it, you have a successful exit and you say, I'm never doing that again. And then three months later, you're sitting on a beach figuring out what your next company is going to be. Oh, I, I definitely think that there's a class of people who like can't really do anything else. Um, and I call them psychologically unemployable. <laughs> I feel you there. I'm, I'm a little bit in that category myself, uh, despite being an investor. Um, I think about this myself. I'm like, well, you know, I could have just gone and joined a bigger fund and that would have been a lot easier in a lot of ways than, than going off on my own. Um, uh, but you know, you kind of got to do what you got to do. And I think for some people, that's really the only option. Why did you start your own fund. I mean, you're, you're working for BitGo, you're a big company. It's, it's doing well now. It's run by some great leadership and um, you were there early on and the, the, bull, the bear market, the bear market's ending in 2016, I think it was. And w- why jump? Why move? What did you- yeah. So, um, I'd gotten to know an entrepreneur and investor named Tcom Bernstein. And so the two of us had been kind of, we sort of bonded because we were both very into crypto pretty early. And so would discuss like the future of colored coins and other bizarre topics <laughs> at all hours of the day. Um, and so, uh, Tcon had been considering starting a, a fund. Um, and at some point was like, Hey, why don't you come do this with me? And so, um, the two of us, I left BitGo and we started a fund together and that was really more of a generalist, um, seed and a little bit of series a fund. Um, because where did you raise the money from? Um, a number of investors, uh, we worked with a group called trusted insight, which, um, works with a lot of kind of newer emerging managers, uh, and a number of other kind of family offices. But the interesting thing there is like crypto was the reason that we started working together. Um, But we realized that at that point in time, it was just going to be kind of impossible um, to raise any substantial amount of capital to deploy into the space. Um, But also it wasn't necessarily going to be um, like we didn't really know where we would have put the money other than really just buying Bitcoin Um, because, you know, that was the best investment ever. Right. Well, true. Yeah. But uh (laughs) But, you know, Ethereum was was coming out and all that sort of stuff. But it was just so early that it was um, having a fully focused fund wouldn't have made a lot of sense. Um, so we just invested in a number of kind of early stage tech companies um, across different industries. A lot of them were Y Combinator companies because that was kind of our network in San Francisco. Um, and yeah, you know, so, so I definitely learned a ton about kind of early stage investing um, across industries. And a lot of that maps very well to to crypto and what i'm seeing more and more of and this is not surprising is really that um more and more different types of businesses are becoming crypto enabled or crypto related and so um you know uh-huh. actually having an understanding of of different industries is really helpful even if you're quote unquote running a crypto fund crypto enabled interesting mm-hmm. term Yeah. I mean, what I mean by that is really just that, um, right now, you know, things start out and you have like a crypto industry, um, and everybody's kind of in that industry, but then as the technology becomes more pervasive and applied in more different contexts, then you get, you know, different kinds of businesses that are using crypto or sorry, I'll use it. Blockchains (laughs) for various cases. I don't like that word blockchain. I like crypto better. (laughs) All right, we'll stick with that. Um, well, because crypto in- implies cryptography, and and a lot of these blockchains or permissioned blockchains don't really—they're just glorified Google Google spreadsheets. Yeah, that's true. But you know, in general, what I mean is is people are using um, some components of this technology and different uh, implementations of it in a variety of different use cases. So if you look at something like, I don't know, foam, they're in kind of the mapping space. So are they a mapping company or are they a crypto company? Um, and you know, gaming, same thing. So all of these different, um, kind of industries and verticals are starting to apply the technology in different ways. Um, and so that's why I think it's actually very helpful to have been a more generalist early stage investor. Well, I love maps. Explain to me foam, like mapping and how, how does blockchain get involved in that or crypto get involved in that? Well, I'm not an investor there, so I'm not an expert, but the general idea is that um, they are uh, 
basically there's kind of a monopoly that Google has on um, mapping. Google Maps, data. Google Earth, yeah. Yeah, and so they um, charge quite a bit of money for access to that data, particularly around uh, points of interest. And in places like New York, obviously, there's a very high density of that. Um, and so they have basically a mechanism where they incentivize people to go out and collect this data um, and not just collect it, but also verify that the data that's been provided is actually accurate. Um, and so, you and know, use the a idea, token to incentivize mm -hmm. people and then I, I get it. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, so that's just, you know, one use case, which I think is really interesting. Um, but there's, there's many, many more. Um, and you know, that's just kind of what I mean by the, the idea that crypto is going to be, I think kind of ubiquitous across various industries. It's definitely not the solution to every problem, but it, uh, it has a lot of interesting applications. Do you only invest in like crypto enabled companies or are you, you invest so, all across the board? The fund I was I was just describing uh, is called Crystal Towers Capital, and that fund um, is still active. Um, but most of my time is spent now on um, my new fund, which is called ASP, and it is a crypto fund. So we invest across, uh, really across the entire space in terms of doing both coin and token investments, both liquid and illiquid, um, and equity investments for companies in the space. So the vast majority of my time is spent at this point, um, just looking at this industry. And frankly, you know, I, I, <laughs> I am always impressed slash shocked that people can, uh, do crypto as kind of a small part of their overall investment strategy, because I find that there is so much going on in the space that it would be very difficult for me to be doing this and running a generalist fund. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, there's just so much going on and it's, it's a full-time job and a half to keep tabs on everything. Um, Got a tab suspender. So for me, it makes sense there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But uh, for me, it makes sense to be totally focused there. I still feel like it's hard to raise money in the crypto space. Like the traditional way, not not as doing a, a token. As a company or as a fund? As a company. Um, I think if you're that not, if you're not in California or not in Silicon Valley or you don't have the relationships for that. Yeah, I think um, obviously having the relationships helps. Uh, the founder's background and pedigree is, uh, you know, also very important just in terms of uh, being investors often default to that as a signaling mechanism, rightly or wrongly, but that's what ends up happening many, much of the time. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think it's uh, it's true that fundraising is at the minimum a very highly variable experience. Some people go out and they raise their You have their to know how to do like, it. It's, it's a job in and of itself. And if you don't know how to do it the right way, if you don't know how to play the game, an investor is like marriage on steroids. It's harder to maintain a relationship with an investor than it is to maintain a relationship with your significant other. Well, I'll push back a little bit on, Please you do. know, the the strategy component, because I think that's often overplayed. Like founders go out and they're like, oh, like this, you know, what what should I do? What well, order it's like should courting. I do? It's like courting. It's like going on dates. You got to court each other. Then you got to not return the other person's phone call. It's like, you know how it is. Yeah, but at the end of the day, I think it's it's not that complicated. It's like build a good business, and if you do, people will want to give you money. There's, you know, sure, some cases you're in like a new industry that people don't understand, so you'll have a harder time. Like there are definitely edge cases that make it more difficult, but in general, um, like – the, the best companies actually have, I think, the worst fundraising strategy because it's like everyone wanted to give them money. You look at Facebook, like I, I bet Mark Zuckerberg is no master of the fundraise because he's basically yeah, since Justin Timberlake to help him out. Yeah, but, you know, they would <sighs> have raised movie. money in a, in a second. Sure. But they would have raised money in a second anyway. So I yeah, think at sure. the end of the day. Um, sure, like having some experience helps, but it's certainly not necessary. Um, and many of the most successful businesses ever were, were built by founders who didn't have super long track records um, and who hadn't raised a ton of money before. So in many cases, uh, I don't think that's, you know, it's, it's definitely not necessary. I moved to Florida three years ago. Uh, my wife and I moved here a few years ago and there was a um... The in Southwest Florida, where we live, so we're not near Miami. We're on the other coast. We're near Tampa. We're an hour south of Tampa in Sarasota. And in Southwest Southwest Florida has a culture in and of itself. It's very very wealthy, um, but it's we're just as everyone's semi retired. I say semi retired because they they play golf half the day and then they run their businesses half the day. So you don't, <laughs> you don't unlike Miami, you have no full time retirees here. 
It's very arts, very culture, the best restaurants. And the reason I bring it up is I, I love, I moved down here because the, the cost of living is super low. The quality of life is high and there's no state income tax. When I moved down here, there wasn't a huge crypto scene in 2016. Um, there was a, some in Tampa, but not here in Sarasota. And when I went on Coin ATM radar, I found there was like three Bitcoin ATMs in the Sarasota Venice area. And I met I met the guys who who owned it because I wanted to create some some roots in the local crypto community. And they were it. It was these three guys, um, Lee Leonard and and Mark. And they had three Bitcoin ATM machines that they kind of started just for fun. And this was three years ago. And I love the concept of of the Bitcoin ATM because these guys had built out the machines are all built here in Florida. Um, they all come from from backgrounds. One is a CPA. The other one builds the machines. He's he's an engineer. So he builds the machines himself. The other one is a software developer. He writes all the software for the machine. So nothing's outsourced. Everything is is good. And they had three machines, and I fell in love with these machines. So I said to these guys, I said, I'll invest a few hundred thousand dollars in, and I want to see you grow. And so now at this point. They have 80 machines through, throughout 10 states. They're still based here in Florida. They have 80 machines. Um, and they've grown and they're making money. They're making a very a nice amount of money. Big staff and everything. The problem is they've reached a point where I can't help them anymore. And they need to raise more money in order to really grow, potentially go public. I'm not sure what the next step is. But they've traveled to Silicon Valley at least twice. To no avail. They've not been able to raise. I mean, these guys have everything is is completely great. They have a cash transport. Their company is called Byte Federal. They have a cash transport company, uh, Garda, that picks up all the money. And they have a bank. They have a bank that actually knows and likes what they're doing. They don't have to worry about their bank account actually getting shut down. They have a whole system and it works really well, but they haven't been able to raise money just because they don't know how to do it. They don't no, maybe I scared them a little bit and that's my fault. They're telling them that there's a whole courtship involved, but they've not been able to, to do it the right way. Maybe they're, they're worried about giving up equity. I'm not really sure. What would you say to them? Gosh, well, it's hard to give uh, advice like that. If I, if I haven't seen any of their materials or exactly what they're doing. Um, I mean, I would, I would try to figure out like, you know, what the issue is, is there another, yeah, well, f- if they can get honest feedback or back channel feedback, that's certainly helpful. Um, but what I would do is figure out how to keep building the business without that capital um, and keep some of those investors apprised. Oftentimes a no is actually a not now or not yet. Hmm. And if they continue to build the business and it's working, I think potentially a lot of those investors would be open to changing. So that's their what they're trying to do now. They're, they're basically saying we're going to continue building the company we're using the money that we're making to reinvest it and to build more machines, but their investors have been involved in, since for a few years now are looking to get their money out in some way. And so they're trying to push to do like a, an IPO or something like that. That's, I think that's where the pressure comes from. Mm, I see. Um, yeah. I mean, look, I, I don't, I don't know enough to really comment on, sure, on sure. their specific case. Um, but in general, you know, I would just say, keep building the business and venture capital may or may not be the right option for all founders. I think oftentimes it's glorified as just like, Oh, you raised all this venture money, like congratulations. And really, it's not really a successful metric. It's not, it's, it shouldn't be a metric of your success. Well, I think it, it, it's a positive signal, but it's certainly not defining all defining. And, um, there's many ways to build a company. Uh, a lot of a lot of the best businesses didn't end up raising much venture money or any venture money until later, or in some cases, not at all. Um, and so, you know, they'll they potentially have a very bright future, regardless of of what a few investors think. What are some of the positive traits that you look for when you're meeting a founder or CEO of a company that you may want to invest in? Um. You know, I, I would say definitely a, a kind of scrappiness and get it done mentality. I think um, people who have demonstrated an ability to like problem solve and work around issues that have come up in the past uh, without getting stuck is is a big part of it. Um, you know, people who have integrity and who I feel are 
worthy of, of trust because at the end of the day, how do you um, tell though? You know, well, oftentimes that's via references and, and, um, relationships. So how am I getting introduced to this founder? Is this somebody that has worked with people that I know in the past or somebody who, um, others speak very highly of. Um, so some of that, you know, frankly, I think you meet enough people and you start to have a pretty good radar about these kinds of things, but then you also cross-reference that with, um, with back channel references, um, which I think can be very informative. Very interesting. And are there any like negative things that you see, if you see immediately, you'll say no way? Um, I mean, I think, yeah, if people are, are rude or dismissive or come across as very defensive, that can be, can be a, a flag. Um, because oftentimes, you know, this is a long standing relationship and I want people who want to learn and, uh, not necessarily just from me, but who are open to input from other people, whether that's other investors or, or other, um, members of their team. Um, you know, it's a fine line, right? Because you want somebody who is like headstrong enough that they'll build this company, whether or not other people think it's a good idea, but you also want somebody who is open-minded to, uh, to changing course if that's what needs to happen. And in some cases, oftentimes that does need to happen. So, um, Sorry, I was saying, but but being a VC is not just handing you a check, right? Like your job doesn't end there. Definitely not. That's why I'm saying I want people who want to work with me and others to actually build the business. Um, How involved I'll, are you? I would say I'm pretty involved. Um, I that's why I don't tend to invest in a ton of companies because I do like to keep tabs on what's going on so I can, you know, be helpful, whether that's with hiring or kind of strategy, strategy decisions, um, making introductions to other potential kind of partners or customers, um, depending on what the, the company or the project is doing, um, all kinds of stuff. Biggest fear founders have with investors, at least with me, is that when times are going great, everything is good, the investors involved, and that's great. But when times are bad, the fear is that the investor will just write you off and will stop answering the calls and stop helping you. How do you, how do you alleviate that concern? Um, well, by, by not doing that. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think if anything, I tend to check in more when things are, are not going well. Um, not because I'm trying to like be overly involved or anything like that, but because, um, you know, obviously I want to be helpful. And in many cases, I'm also genuinely concerned about the founder. I think if, if the company is struggling, oftentimes I, I know how hard the people I back work and I know how much they care about what they're doing. And uh, if it's unpleasant for me, it's way worse for them because they tend to have all their eggs in one basket and um, be so emotionally and personally invested in their businesses that it's like, it's not just a business, it's, it's like their entire life. And so, you know, I definitely want to make sure that they're okay as people um, because a lot of people who, who, you know, end up going on to do great things, had some rough patches, uh, I would say most, um, and or had some, some failures in their past. And so that's a perfectly normal part of the process. And so I, I want to be as supportive as possible during those times. Is there a difference between uh, a founder of a crypto company and a founder of a, I don't know, a biomedical, biotechnology company or just a non-crypto founder? Um, I don't, I don't know that there is. I mean, I think at the end of the day, there are people who are, you know, building companies, developing technology, uh, and want to generally speaking, improve the world in some fashion. So I think that the, the core pieces are still the same. It's just kind of the way in which they do it. That's slightly different. What's, what's most exciting for you right now? Which industry do you think that has built out in the bear market is, is going to do very well in the next year or two? Um, I am very excited about what's happening in kind of the financial infrastructure, specifically the DeFi or open finance community. Okay. Um, I think that's where we're seeing some of the real first signs of product market fit. Um, and I think that's really interesting. I've kind of had a, a belief that that was going to happen for a while and that's why I've been allocating there. But if you look at kind of usage numbers for something like maker or, 
Dharma or, you know, Uniswap, things like Maker that are, are super growing very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, give me some examples of some companies that you've been investing in that, that are in the space. Well, I just said a few. <laughs> oh, you um, underratedly pitched them. I didn't even realize. I thought you were just giving general oh, yeah. examples. Oh, I'm so smooth. No, I'm, I'm not an investor in, in Uniswap, but I am in the others. Um, yeah. And, and the cool thing though, about, you know, crypto networks is that you don't necessarily have to be an early investor who, you know, got into the, the seed round of any particular thing. You can just go and buy the token and participate in that way if you want. Um, and so these are, you know, you can participate by actually using these financial products and then you can also participate by owning, you know, say MKR governance token or something like that. Um, and I think that's a really novel model, uh, but one that I find particularly exciting. What else? Um, what else am I excited about? Um, I think cool stuff excited is starting to happen. In. In. Yeah, I think, I think gaming is definitely interesting. Um, I think we're in the very early phases of, of what's going to happen there, but this idea of having, um, you know, it's kind of gaming and collectibles, um, NFTs and the ability to kind of, uh, have digital versions of, of, um, assets that you can control the supply of and, and the scarcity of and demonstrate ownership, um, is neat. I like the idea of eliminating some of the middlemen in the gaming industry and giving more money back to the creators of the actual games. Um, and so somebody like GameStop, who is making pretty much all of the secondary revenue off, uh, you know, a, a game sale. Oh, they control like, the secondary market. That? Yeah. They can yeah. Control. Well, that's like There's what no ticket sales and things like that. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, folks like Tari are, are tackling that. So there's, there's a lot of different companies who are trying to solve different uh, parts yeah, of these problems. Party that's doing something like that too, with ticket sales. I just met the CEO yeah. of that company in Miami last week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not familiar with them, but uh, it sounds, sounds similar for sure. You told me earlier that you traveled between San Francisco and New York. Um, where do you call home though? Uh, Good question. Um, still figuring like that? that out. <laughs> I'm born and raised um, in New York. I left three years ago. We left mm, and mm -hmm. never never went back. I think New York is is a better city at the end of the day. Um, there's just more different groups of people. There's more to do. There's more to see. There's more um, more novelty. Um, now you have to watch your back in California. San Francisco. No, I love San Francisco too. I mean, I think some of the smartest, most motivated um, people live there. And I think that has been one of the reasons why I've loved being there so much over the last few years. So they're, they're very different. I mean, I think, I think the dream is just being bi-postal. So, um, pretty lucky in that respect. How often do you travel back and forth? Um, okay? I, yeah, sorry. I'm not sure what's, what's going on outside. It might be someone on the roof. Um, San Francisco, uh, New York. I, I'm in New York at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, urban, urban, urban living. Um, yeah, I'm. Uh, I travel back and forth uh, usually once or twice a month, so oh, pretty wow. often. Yeah. So yeah. thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it, and it's so fascinating what you're doing and your personality and and how you've evolved in the space. Again, thank you so much. If people want to follow what you're doing, what can they do? Um, I think the best thing to do is follow me on Twitter. So it's just at Ariana Simpson. Fantastic, Ariana. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Charlie. Hey everyone, thanks for listening. New episodes of Untold Stories go live every Tuesday at 7 a.m. EST. Links to our Apple and Spotify channels are in the show notes. You can also follow me on Twitter, Charlie Shrem, to continue the conversation. See you next week.